everybody. Thank you to the Milton Park community for hosting this event. And also thank you for Black Rose Books for publishing uh, our book. My name is Mustafa Hanali. I'm one of the co-editors of the book along with Jason Prince and Eric Schrag, Montreal Citizen's Guide to City Politics. And uh, uh, is along the Prison Francais, Politique Urbaine à Montréal, Engage the Citoyen. So, c'est vraiment un pleasure. This was a work that took three years, trois ans. Pour les Massé, I think really what is a diverse and incredible group of activists and writers who are really. Uh, on the ground with the issues that they that they tackle in terms of the urban uh, uh, at, at the city level, uh, whether it be redevelopment and, and neoliberalism, whether it be the housing crisis, uh, the climate to, to, to the climate crisis we face, but also uh, resistance in different neighborhoods, whether it be in Point Saint Charles, avec le chapitre par Jocelyn or Nathan talking about the, the sort of the history, the legacy, and sort of, and, and the current campaigns uh, that Milton Park community has been engaged to ensure and expand ideas of, of communal land trusts, of uh, a cooperative movement that sort of takes our city life and, our, and the way we live off of the market, right? And, and so, and to think about those possibilities beyond uh, capitalism, uh, especially uh, at the moment, the kind of the urgency we face. So the book is is really, I think, an important um, intervention into the city, and to especially not just during the municipal elections, but I think particularly after the, the municipal elections, right? Because a lot of the movements that uh, and issues that people engage with in the in, in the pages of the book uh, are really our long-term struggles, our long-term campaigns, right? And that uh, and what we try to sort of bring about in the book is that uh, there are real limits to what can take place in the electoral cycle, right? Without fundamental changes, right? To the way that our cities are governed to the balance of power, uh, to the way movements uh, either conceive or don't conceive uh, urban, you know, uh, you know, the urban setting or our cities as being critical vehicles of change, not just because they bring us together, uh, but really they're the manifestations of, of all of, of all of what's ill uh, in terms of the way our societies are organized, economically, politically, and socially, right? So uh, in terms of the, the heightened inequality, in terms of the ways in which uh, structural racism plays out, and a lot of people don't view municipal politics as being important. And I think that's beginning to change, right? When we look at uh, the movements around Black Lives Matter and uh, defunding the police right across North America, or the movements for a sanctuary city, right? To protect and shield uh, a racialized and precarious migrant workforce that's critical to our cities, right? When we thinking about, uh, you know, when we think about the 1% and the 99%, where all of that money has gone beyond uh, uh, fiscal, you know, tax havens, uh, all of that money that is being pumped right back into our cities as speculative real estate investment. And it's created the, you know, the most acute housing crisis everywhere. It's universal, right? And that's what's amazing about it now. It's not, uh, and it's monopolized and it's, it's global, right? The same Swedish company that's one of the largest landlords here in Montreal, Achilles is the same uh, in Berlin. Right, it's uh, so we're very much uh, we're at a crossroads. So I think this book is really about trying to begin that conversation and 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 how can we bring those things together, right? And uh, so the book kind of ends off with uh, a manifesto from an initiative that uh, several people here are part of, uh, which is called Pernod La Ville, uh, Take the City, which is trying to bring together. 
a diverse coalition, right? So uh, of, of organizations and of movements that don't usually talk to each other, right? And I think those things uh, we believe in the book are really important if we're going to address uh, a lot of these uh, issues, right? And uh, and they're all interconnected in, in, in obvious ways, right? And, um, you know, one line that I always like to think about is, you know, if one looks at the municipal budget, uh, it's very obvious, right? It's it, what's going on is what's our biggest revenue and what's our biggest expenditure. Our biggest revenue is property taxes, right? Cities rely 70% uh, on property revenues. There's no independent taxation, not like you know cities back then, such as Vienna, which was able to raise money and, and tax uh, the wealthy to be able to fund massive social housing, right? We rely on the opposite. We rely on the market for housing, right? So uh, we're beholden, no matter who's in power, to the power of developers and to the power of finance because it's going to raise the value and that will raise the revenue. But then the flip side of what, what's our largest expense as a city? It's actually public safety. It's actually policing, right? So when people are calling for increased you know, social housing, and decrease police funding, they're very much linked uh, because the money's coming in from one hand and going right to, to the other, right? So if we defunded the police, maybe we wouldn't rely on developers as much, right? But that that means thinking about the city in, in, in a much more deeper way. And I think that we're beyond sort of the, the petty politics that we think about uh, in city hall. So. It's a real pleasure to have worked on this book, and uh, and we're going to have a few speakers, and then we'll have an open discussion. So all of the speakers have been people who've contributed uh, to the to the book, uh, and maybe I'm going to start off with Norma. So Norma Ratisi, who is uh, the graduate director and uh, professor at Concordia University in the Geography and Planning and uh, Studies. Uh, Department uh, Department at Concordia, but also she is one of uh, founding and active members in the Planners Network, uh, which is a, uh, a group trying to think about uh, these progressive, you know, progressive politics at the urban level, uh, as well as one of the editors of uh, Progressive City, which is a website that brings together a lot of these issues. Uh, no, it's also co-author uh, on the chapter of re urban redevelopment in, in Chapinau. Thank you, Papa. Um, so I'm just going to speak really briefly about the chapter that Mustafa and I co-authored on Chapinau. I feel like Mustafa really laid a good foundation for that kind of a discussion. Um, one of the key themes that Mustafa has picked up on is the fact that because cities are so reliant on property taxes, that property redevelopment becomes the primary strategy for quote unquote economic development. Uh, it becomes almost reduced to property redevelopment and by extension property speculation to raise the revenue base. So that's one of the issues we see playing out in places like Chavanel, in the sense that um, one of the defining features historically of Montreal was that it was part of the industrial heartland, much like uh, Toronto and other parts of, of the center. And um, in roughly the starting in the late 70s, early 80s, with trade liberalization and outsourcing, what we Called neoliberal globalization, that we had the loss of you know, tens of thousands of manufacturing jobs. And, uh, you know, Chevenel had a particularly important place within Montreal as the heart of the garden industry, not just for Montreal, but for all of Canada, from the 1960s really onwards until roughly the 1990s. Uh, due to this loss of employment and the loss of uh, manufacturing activities. And as a consequence of this, we really see then a void happen in 
checking out. We have, um, in terms of the emptying out of warehouse buildings, the large warehouse buildings, many of which were constructed specifically for the garment industry in the 60s. And we also see an economic void. Um, and we find that one of the things that would come as a consequence would emerge is a rethinking of the district and of its role within the broader economy. And so that's not to say that there isn't still some activities associated with the garment industry, but increasingly what we're seeing are the more high-end functions. Things like uh, the showrooms, the design, the logistical production management stuff, but not the assembly jobs that we used to see. And instead, we see new branding of the district. Actually, the, na the new name for the area is District Central, and it's, which is a bit ironic because it's not quite central <laughs> in the island, but, um, but it's a repositioning also of kind of the mental or symbolic associations of the place and trying to kind of present it as more of a creative or an innovative center. This follows along the lines of thinking of people like Richard Florida who promote this notion of the creative city for the creative class, this class that's highly mobile, highly creative, innovative, highly skilled and educated and are well remunerated for it, but also this notion of providing certain amenities that could appeal to a certain kind of class of workers. Um, but, uh, and, and one of the things we see in terms of the city's relation vis-a-vis -vis the area is a lot of beautification schemes and or things like uh, we had the Societe de Housing Habitation de Montréal um, underwriting the development of condos in one of major warehouse buildings rather than you know, prioritizing more affordable or collective forms. Um, and we see also um, increasingly industrial capital, former manu major manufacturing companies moving into real estate investment in the area, becoming themselves invest investors in the new marketing and branding for other kinds of activities, whether it's technology or office uh, kinds of activities. Um, and it really raises questions of what other avenues of development are closed off when that happens. Um, for instance, we see with the loss of manufacturing jobs, we simultaneously see the loss of economic opportunities for people at different skill-based levels. Right? Um, and when land, and, it, and another thing important point to note is there is quite a bit of municipal owned land in the area as well, but uh, you know, when it's being channeled for profit, for the use of speculative redevelopment, um, you know, that it raises questions about what are the prospects for using the land for more collective forms of ownership, for collective enterprise uh, activity rather than um, you know, simply appealing to the highest bidder. Um, so these, I think, are important questions that we come to uh, towards the end of the chapter is thinking about, you know, what, could this, what role could the city play to promote alternatives um, and something that we're, we haven't quite seen. And on that, I'll just mention one final thing for wrapping up, which is, for instance, there's there's one thing that's interesting that the city has instituted in regards to housing, which is the first right to refusal. Mm -hmm. And the idea of being able to then purchase land when it's on the market, particularly in de to, for dedicating it to social housing purposes. So one question we have in relation to rethinking economic development and economic development strategies what about a potential first right to refusal for economic activity and for collective ownership? Why can't we, you know, imagine other other ways of relating um, 
to the market and to creating these alternatives that decommodify the space on which we live and we make livelihood. I'll end it on that. Thank you. Sites of, of, of redevelopment when there is no active uh, community that's really organized to push back for those alternatives, what actually takes place. And we can see the opposite uh, with what's happening uh, in terms of the Bonaventure, uh, the Peel Basin, right? So, um, and so I'm going to let uh, Jocelyn Bernet say, vraiment, and Grande militante de Pointe-Saint-Charles, uh, elle est résidente de Pointe-Saint-Charles, elle a plus de 40 ans, uh, aussi uh, résidente à coordinatrice pour la clinique communautaire de Pointe-Saint-Charles, uh, et maintenant uh, aussi uh, sur le retrait de, de travail pour l'Institut uh, de la recherche de santé de public à l'Université de Montréal. Uh, maintenant, elle est active dans uh, le projet pour l'action gardienne, pour le comité, pour uh, le pire paysan, pour le Bonaventure. Uh, Bonaventure Bridgeway? Bridge. Bonaventure Bridgeway. Uh, projet, une vraiment grande bataille dans la ville de Montréal pour la communauté de Pointe-Saint-Charles, mais aussi pour le gain de. Capital uh, à Montréal. So, merci beaucoup, Jocelyne, et uh, merci pour d'être uh, là. Merci. Et ces organisations-là sont toujours existantes. Ils dépassent leurs 50 ans. Vous savez qu'au départ, le programme qui s'attendait que ça allait durer comme ça. Et ils sont toujours dirigés par des conseils d'administration de citoyens et de citoyennes qui s'impliquent dans des luttes pour améliorer les conditions de vie et aussi pour la défense des droits, surtout auprès des, pour les personnes qui euh, sont moins nantis. L'aménagement urbain, c'est aussi un terrain de lutte qui a été très actif euh, parce que ça cause beaucoup d'exclusion de, avec toute la gentrification comme dans plusieurs quartiers à proximité du centre-ville de Montréal et même là, si ça s'étend, ça s'en vient euh, dramatique. On refuse que le développement de la ville à Pointe-Saint-Charles, en tout cas, que ce soit les promoteurs immobiliers qui euh, n'ont pour but que de faire des profits qui soient les maîtres de On a un exemple juste dans notre voisinage, Griffin Town, qui a monté des tours de logement. Chaque promoteur a monté sa tour, mais on avait oublié d'avoir une école. On avait oublié de développer des parcs. Et l'arrondissement a dû rétrograder pour acheter le terrain et développer avec euh, des gens qui bâtissent des coopératives, incluant une école. C'est pour nous un exemple négatif qui est important. Les conséquences de toute cette gentrification-là, on a perdu. On aime les batailles, il y en a qu'on a perdu. Par exemple, toute la bordure du canal de la Chine, comme disait Norma, hein, maintenant, pour être Saint-Charles, dans certains cercles, ce sont les quartiers du canal. C'est la, la marque euh, un peu de, de, de gentrification. Ça s'est développé d'abord sur la rive nord, Saint-Henri, euh, on était euh, beaucoup affecté par ça, et maintenant, ça a plus sur ta camp. Et maintenant, c'est euh, sur la rive sud du canal. Euh, ça a des impacts importants sur la hausse des valeurs foncières, c'est plus que 400 d'augmentation depuis 5 ans. 
Euh, et donc, vous voyez, la hausse des loyers, c'est vertigineux ici. Là, c'est euh, 25 au moins d'augmentation. Ce qui fait que, puis là, on est aux prises avec des rénovations, comme dans beaucoup d'autres quartiers, sous prétexte de rénover, on subdivise les logements. Euh, puis euh, il y a les maisons de chambre, là maintenant une lutte importante sur les maisons de chambre qui ont été rachetées, puis encore là on veut expulser euh, les gens qui y habitent pour vraiment re redévelopper soit pour un BNB ou pour euh, des lots ou des, des appartements de luxe. On a mené une lutte importante euh, en termes d'aménagement urbain. Euh, dans les années 2000, vous avez probablement entendu parler de la bataille contre le déménagement du casino. Pourquoi j'en parle? Parce que c'est une stratégie qui va revenir avec un stade de baseball. Ouais, 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 ouais. Hein, la lutte pour le contre le développement du casino, c'est après, on a réussi à faire certains gains. Un des immenses fiches industrielles qui étaient les anciens ateliers du CM, avec une lutte acharnée, on a réussi à obtenir au moins 30 de logements sociaux. Traditionnellement, dans le quartier, c'est 40 Et c'est ça notre revendication. Logements sociaux communautaires sur différentes formules, donc BME, coopérative, et le reste. Et euh, on a aussi obtenu la cession du bâtiment. Il faut dire que ce, cette immense friche industrielle avait été achetée par un promoteur, le groupe MAC, pour un dollar, avec l'obligation de décompter le lieu. Mais, euh, donc, la lutte a permis d'obtenir un certain pourcentage, ce qui permet de maintenir une mixité dans le quartier. Parce que là, on, que ce soit les ghettos pauvres ou les ghettos de riches, à mon avis, il n'y a rien de pire euh, pour les citoyens de, pour diviser euh, entre nous, là, puis là, faire perdre finalement euh, des droits à plusieurs d'entre nous. Euh, ce qui fait qu'on a aussi obtenu la cession d'un bâtiment, qui est le bâtiment A7 qui appartenait au CN, où se développent des projets euh, collectifs. Il y a une brasserie, une brasserie collective. Euh, des ateliers d'artistes, qui va avoir des euh, centres d'artistes enfants, c'est tout ça. Donc, on se préoccupe beaucoup aussi du développement des parcs qu'on a fait une consultation il n'y a pas très longtemps sur les terrains euh, pour avoir, pour, qu'est-ce que les gens veulent comme aménagement. En fait, maintenant, on fait face à cette autre tentative qui est sur euh, le site du bassin Pille. Notre position, au bassin de il y a un immense terrain qui appartient à la Société immobilière du Canada. Et elle a, soit disant, pour mission de faire de l'argent avec. Nous, on dit, un terrain public doit servir des intérêts collectifs. C'est là que le groupe Rontman, il y en a, veulent installer leur stade de baseball. Et c'est le travail avec un promoteur qui s'appelle Devinco, qui est un des maîtres d'œuvre de Griffintown pour développer un quartier de luxe. Et euh, ils disent qu'ils ne veulent pas de subvention gouvernementale, mais imaginez la valeur de ce terrain-là, juste sur leur cible, c'est une énorme subvention. Alors, on est en plein dans cette bataille-là. La façon dont on travaille beaucoup dans le quartier, on fait ce qu'on appelle des opérations populaires de ménagement. C'est la table de quartier Action Gardienne, la Corporation de développement communautaire, qui a mené toute une campagne avec l'aide de professionnels, par exemple le service aux collectivités du CAM, les professeurs en géographie des étudiants, nous a aidé à faire l'analyse du secteur. On a développé des, des fiches, on a fait des visites de terrain avec la société d'histoire pour que les gens s'approprient parce que c'est un quartier, une zone qui est industrielle et qui est en, pas mal en friche actuellement. On a fait des tournées dans nos organismes communautaires interrompus un peu euh, par la pandémie et on a réuni, finalement, il y a venu plus d'une centaine de citoyens et citoyennes à une fin de semaine où il y avait encore des visites de terrain puis des ateliers pour rêver, pour voir parce que qu'est-ce qu'on veut comme développement qui répond à nos besoins, qu'est-ce qu'on rêve comme environnement ou vivre. 
À partir de ça, on, il y a eu six équipes de travail qui ont, qui ont travaillé. On a mis ça en commun et on a déposé un mémoire et on a fait aussi des guides pour tous les gens qui voulaient déposer des mémoires à l'Office de consultation publique de Montréal. Pour dire que l'Office a repris 90 de nos recommandations, à l'exception d'une qui est très importante pour nous, nous, on dit que les terrains publics se doivent servir uniquement à du logement collectif, que ce soit communautaire, coopératif ou autre. Là. Eux, les terrains sont positionnés sur le 2020. Mais vu du quartier, le, la politique du 2020, pour nous, c'est un recul. Alors, euh, on veut la bataille continue. Là, euh, la ville de Montréal, l'administration municipale a fait des ateliers avec des promoteurs et autres. Tu sais, vouloir... Mais à un moment donné, les intérêts sont conflictuels. Il n'est pas possible de, tout, euh, de faire un consensus artificiel. Alors, on en est là. Le chapitre qu'on a écrit relate un petit peu cette lutte-là et... Euh, un peu en faisant le lien avec l'histoire. Et la question qui en sort, c'est qui développe la ville. C'est repointé dernièrement l'Institut de, de développement urbain, qui est un des promoteurs. Hein. Pour eux, ce sont eux les bâtisseurs de la ville. Alors que pour nous, ça devrait être la ville qui encadre et contraint euh, les promoteurs qui développent du logement, mais qui oriente le développement de la ville. On intervient aussi dans notre milieu sur, euh, pendant la campagne électorale. Et ce qu'on va chercher, c'est euh, des promesses ou des engagements. Déjà, dans des bons points dessinés, là, quand je vois que euh, l'équipe Ensemble Montréal est dans une densification euh, douce, ça me fait dresser les cheveux sur la tête, mais aussi, il faut. Dans nos propositions, on, devait, on a parlé autant de l'habitation, de la réorganisation des entreprises pour enlever le transit automobile dans notre quartier. On a sur les parcs espaces le verdissement, le quartier résilient et tout ça. C est, c est vraiment, notre approche, c'est de développer notre vision de notre milieu de vie. Puis, euh, c'est ça. ça. On essaie de faire valoir dans la campagne électorale. Mais au fond, la campagne électorale, ce ne sont que des promesses. Et c'est essentiel comme citoyen dans nos quartiers qu'on ait un suivi constant. On a eu des opérations populaires en 2004 sur le quartier bâti. On a eu une en 2007 sur la friche industrielle du terrain du terrain. On vient d'en avoir une en 2019 sur le bassin clean et on a des comités de suivi que vous savez parler, le comité Bridge Bonne Aventure, parce que c'est vraiment du long terme. Hein? Si on veut que la ville nous ressemble et qu'elle soit habitable, résiliente, inclusive, il faut qu'on continue constamment, pas juste dans les temps forts des élections, parce que sinon les promesses, ça passe. Hein? Alors, euh, c'est un peu ce qu'on raconte comme histoire. Mais a, on n'est pas le seul quartier qui mène des luttes, là, euh, mais on, on est tenace. On ne veut pas lâcher le morceau. Est-ce qu'on va gagner? C'est sûr qu'on sait qu'on ne gagnera pas tout, mais au moins garder un quartier qui est vivant, qui est inclusif, qui est pour tout le monde, qui est accessible et qui est résilient face à la crise climatique. C'est essentiel dans tous les quartiers du monde. J'arrête ça. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Jocelyne, et merci pour le chapitre, et merci pour le tout le travail de l'Action Canadien, parce que c'est vraiment trop important pour comment nous pouvons organiser dans les différents quartiers à Montréal c'est qui face euh, le même problème avec le plus de développement, comme le, le Blue Bonnet ou comme le, les gens de Royal Wild ou 
don't let my life say Iliad of Pizia, Kajeme, no, I don't have them. Or fast lament problem. And I'm going to pass it on to our next speaker, who uh, is Nathan McDonald, and who is uh, who wrote an incredible chapter on the history, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, sort of it goes into the same spirit as Jocelyn's chapter uh, on the uppity hoods, but on Milton Park uh, and the history of the movement uh, for the, co the cooperative movement here in Milton Park, uh, as well as the contemporary struggles that uh, the Milton Park Citizens Committee is engaged with now. Uh, Nathan has been a very active member of the Milton Park Citizens Committee uh, and also has been active around the fight for the Royal Victoria Hospital and he is also beyond that uh, one of our, uh, he is an editor uh, with Black Rose Books uh, and so I want to thank him also for the work that they have done to publish the book and the many uh, invaluable books. Uh, as well as he's an intervention worker uh, and part of some great other projects that uh, Milton Park has been engaged with to expand sort of a cooperative economy uh, within the, the neighborhood. So uh, thank you, Nathan, very much for taking the time to speak about, you know, Milton Park and also the chapters. Hello everyone, um, I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, I'll try to keep my talk short, like five to seven, five to seven minutes long. Uh, if you want the full full story, you can read the chapter or come on a walking tour with me. I'm doing a walking tour in French tomorrow at two, and Friday, this coming Friday, in, in the neighborhood here, it's been half, the, the, like community struggles have been going for for over over um over um um over um 50 years, it started in 68 when a company that had quietly bought up six blocks in the neighborhood. They they spent 10 years quietly buy, buying up uh, b buildings under numbered companies. They announced in 68 their plan to demolish the six blocks to make the city of the 21st century with luxury apartments, shopping malls, hotels. And when the community found out, they were like, no way! And they organized to fight against it because they wanted to keep their homes and they wanted to, to protect their, their right to live in affordable housing in downtown Montreal. And they, they did all the activist, uh, you know, all, all the tactics and activist um, playbook, uh, petitions, door to door, uh, protests, etc. They, they got a uh, Two thirds of the people who lived in that in the house and that was to be knocked down, they two, two thirds of them signed their petition and, and, and was and was activated to get involved in the movement. They did they did lots of community community um, um, meetings day after day after day. Um, they even occupied the offices of the company, and then when they were unsuccessful in stopping the first stage of the project. They squatted the housing that was supposed to be knocked down. They really fought right to the very end. Um, unfortunately, they were unsuccessful in stopping the first stage of the project because the project was going to be in three stages, and that first, that a third of the housing was knocked down to build what is now um, 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 the, um, La Cité. In fact, this building here. So three kind of luxury apartment buildings and office tower and a what at the time was a hotel so they built five buildings but then when the community heard that the company was having trouble developing the rest they hatched a plan and the company was having trouble because finally for a few reasons finally the, the um, city sided with the citizens and changed these changed the um, changed the um, zoning to block the rest of the project. Secondly, there was an economic crisis at the time. This is in the in the 70s, and the the value of 
housing went down, so the company was like, there was less incentive to build. And thirdly, because of the activists' mm, tactics, they targeted several of the, of, the, of the funding sources of the project, including the Ford, um, Ford, um, Ford um, Foundation, which is funding the project as like a city, like a, a project of the mm, 21st century kind of cities and stuff. They, they, they went to their annual general meeting in, in the, the activists went to the annual general meeting of the Ford Foundation in Chicago to shame them and, and cause the Ford Foundation to cut their funds and cut their time for the project. And so, because the combination of these factors, the company couldn't develop the rest of it. And when the community found out, they hatched a plan, got together, and offered to buy the housing off the company. Because it's not enough to just fight. You know, it's not enough to protest. We need to build our our own alternatives. And they convinced the federal government, um, at that time the CMHC, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, had just been created. They managed to convince them to subsidize the project, to, to, to be the kind of organization to purchase the housing, and then to transfer it over to the community, who, who would then organize the housing into cooperatives and non-profits, and do all the works to build, bring the buildings up to code, like there were buildings that didn't even have heating. You know? um, so this, this took a whole pro, this whole process took over 10 years of time and like organizing tenants to move out while the housing was, was improved so that they can, the tenants could move back in. This was a whole process that took 10 years. Um, and then to form what, what is today the Milton Park community, which is Housing for 1,200 people in a in a total of about three and a half blocks, including this block which you have right here. In fact, I used to live in a studio for five years, just that there in that little bit, um, in, in a non-profit. The project is made up of 16 housing cooperatives and five housing non-profits, and the co co. Um, um, at, as you probably know, cooperatives are where tenants have to be involved in managing their housing, so it's self, self, self managed. Whereas a non profit is usually a service provided to, to more marginalized people who have, who have a challenge to, kind of, to, to, yeah, to, to be involved. Um, and then, in, in parallel to that history, after the struggle, other activists went on to pioneer in initiatives in urban ecology and participatory um, planning and participatory democracy. They founded the Urban Ecology Centre. They founded Ecology Montreal, which is the first municipal ecological party in North America. They pioneered a lot of uh, projects around street calming, kind of calming down traffic, putting in traffic lights, in fact the traffic lights just here on the street were the result of a, of a, of a struggle and I, I heard the story of Dimitri and Lucia bringing their, their son, who at the time was only 10, of carrying him out on a stretcher with ketchup on him as part of like a, a theatre to kind of show what the effect that cars have on us, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of killing people in car accidents. Um, they were, you know, pioneering lots of things around uh, recycling, composting, cycling, um, participatory planning, public consultation. The, the um, Dimitri and others were they were kind of architects of the uh, charter the, of the the city of Montreal's Charter of Rights and Responsibilities. The le, the OCPM the, the Office de Consultation Publique de Montréal, um, and also participatory, um, participatory um, 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 budgeting as well. Um, looking at my notes, um, and this street itself. There's several buildings on the street that, after the struggle to save the housing, there are also further s um, fights. Um, block to block, street to street. If you start on Pine, the school, what used to be the school on the uh, east corner of John Wilson Pine, was sold to condos. 
but the community was able to save the the presbytery because um, the company wanted to knock down this heritage building to build a parking lot, which was the 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 um, um, fashion at the time in the, in the 50s and 60s. So the community saved it, bought it, and it's now housing for people who are coming off the street, like people who have been homeless. Across the road you have the Strathen Centre, which was a school. It was going to be sold for condos and the community fought, saved it to be used all for culture, like arts and culture. Originally it was supposed to be co-managed co, co by the city and the community to also be a community centre. And eventually the civil servants from the city forced out the community to kind of take, to take control of it. So we, we can't trust the civil servants, just so you know. Um, and, and so that, that's now the Stratham Centre. Uh, you, you probably know it as the, as the mine. Um, then just south of that there used to be a church. Now it's all condos, unfortunately. The community tried to fight that and could. Um, so the struggles, there's a, there was a, um, a there was a building on Park Avenue that was supposed to become a a a sh um, shopping like a sh shopping mall. The community uh, did like did it organized a b o y c o t t boycott. Um, boycott. They did boycott and managed to shame the shame the owners so much that the owners gave the pro I think gave the property to the community or sold it at a very cheap thing, so it's now a housing co-op. Um, Park and Pine Interchange used to be a highway interchange for 40 years, and the community, like, for 40 years was advocating for it to be taken down, and finally in the late 1990s it was taken down to make a simple intersection. Um, and now, so those are lots of the historical struggles, and now we're, we're always uh, continuing the fight, trying to expand where, uh, you know, what we built. We're especially uh, active around the future of the. Oh, yeah. Two other struggles. Two other struggles in the last three years, four years. Uh, we saved two parks. Uh, one is the Notman Gardens on Milton and Clark, which has some of the oldest trees on the island of Montreal. It was privately owned. Was going to become condos, and we fought and fought and fought, and just at the last moment, the last moment before the excavators. Or the, they, they, they weren't actually coming to, like, at that exact moment, but it was like the last moment, all the permits were signed, and the, we, we managed to convince the city to expropriate the, the property to make a park. And the, what, uh, the space on the corner of Park and Pine, on the southeast corner, which uh, was zoned for housing, was zoned for like tall housing and other things, and, Several times the city had tried to build like high-rise towers in the past, and the community freaked out. And the project was cancelled. So it's it was city-owned land, but zoned for housing. We managed to do a petition two years ago, three years ago, and convince the city to make it zoned as a park, so it's protected forever as a park, and it's now named after um, Lucia Kowalik, who was a co-founder of the Milton Park Citizens Committee and of the neighbourhood. So all these struggles, street to street, block to block, uh, for me it shows that communities can run their own neighbourhoods if we get together, if we organise with our neighbours, if we believe in ourselves, believe in the power of us, believe in the power of community to run things. We're continuing our struggles with the two enormous hospitals, the Hotel Dieu Hospital and the Royal Victoria Hospital. Both are provincially owned. Both of them, the government doesn't really know what to do with them. Um, we, 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 like, although the government doesn't know what to do with them, the community does. And we want them to be kept for, for the community through social housing, through healthcare services, community services, urban agriculture, schools, you know. The, the, the needs are so present, and we have a coalition we founded 10 years ago around the Hotel Dieu Hospital, a coalition around the Royal Victoria Hospital we founded, we founded two years ago. It's currently at the city is doing a public consultation about the Royal Victoria Hospital, so now is a very important time for everyone to participate in that public consultation. Um, and the, um, the Royal Victoria site, half of it, um, 
McGill University wants to have half of it for a campus. For, for us, we're not inherently, um, we're not inherently um, um, opposed to, to there being a campus on there, but we want absolutely that we don't want the university to own the land. We want it to be protected forever from, from being sold off for you know, who knows what. And so we want it to remain public ownership and to have, yeah, to have controls over that. And for the rest of the property, because the, for the university, they only want half of the pavilions. So people think that they're going to have the whole site, which is, isn't true. It's just half of the pavilions. And there's a lot of other pavilions that have no projects for them. You know, we, we believe it should be for the community. Um, there's a pavilion that's being used for the homeless now that should continue and expand, etc., etc. Um, and the Chess Hospital on St. Urban was sold to private the developers, so that's a, a, a uh, yeah, sadly. South of the Chess Hospital, there's three provincially owned parking lots. We believe they should absolutely be used for to develop community housing because it's publicly owned property. We have a project in the neighborhood to build how social uh, community housing for seniors, so even non-profit or co-op housing for seniors. We have a lot of seniors who live in the co-ops, which is kind of heritage housing, but because it's heritage, it's not accessible, it's not very adapted for people with health problems. And these are seniors who help build the neighborhood, and now they're getting old, and they don't want to leave the neighborhood to move into a, 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 a retirement home on the suburbs of Montreal. They want to stay in the neighborhood. They want to live in adapted housing with their neighbors. Um, th there is the, um, during COVID, we, we set up a, lots of, um, um, let, lots of, lots of projects around food security and mutual aid, like a food bank, community kitchen, and that's continuing every week. Every Friday, there's a food bank in the church next door. And, and we cook as well, so it's good, healthy, fresh meals. Um, the, um, the bar, we, we, we bought a bar this year. <laughs> um, the, oh, we, yeah, the, the bar de pain on Park, near Pine. The community bought it because the family that, the family that owned it for 20 years, they wanted to leave, and because they're part of the community land, the land um, um, trust. They have to offer it to the community first at a at, at a price below market value. So the community had the first right to buy it, bought it, and we want to make it a uh, cooperative, like a, a a community cafe bar organized as a solidarity co-op. And that's something happening right now. If you know anyone who has experience managing restaurants, cafes, bars, and they're the kind of people who would like to be involved in this project, put them in touch. Um, and it goes on and on and on. Um, I, think, I think I've got out of time. Yeah. So, I, so get involved in your neighborhood, talk to your neighbors, talk about the issues that, 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 that concern you, and yeah, change the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan, for that inspiring talk. Well, I mean, everybody, uh, Jocelyn, Nathan, Norma, all these examples have been inspiring and enriching examples and encourage people to get the book. There's also another book out by Black Rose, uh, which is an edited uh, anthology by Jason Tony, on also called Take the City and uh, Voices of Radical Municipalism. So I encourage people to get that. It's sort of the how to say it's uh it's if, if this is more like a practical guide that's like the the blueprint of like the the thinking through the radical alternatives and, and what's possible and how people should be organized and so it's if I, they both go really hand in hand and so once again thank you very much to milton park citizens committee and black rose books and also to jocelyn norma and nathan uh, um, well, thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you, everybody. We can have. Uh, we have
Yeah, so uh, thank you everybody, and we'll, we'll open up if there's a bit of discussion before I have. Comments, questions? Comments. Puis à un moment donné, il y a à peu près 15 ans, il y a longtemps, mais quand même, euh, sur une petite rue, il y avait une église que les gens voulaient utiliser comme ça, comme une hauteur. Ils ont travaillé les fins de semaine pour tout vider l'église qui était inoccupée. Et puis le projet est resté abandonné. C'est dommage parce que... Il n'y a pas vraiment de centre communautaire dans ce coin-là. Ce que je cherche, à part la bibliothèque sur Georges Vanier, mais tu sais, je trouve ça idiot. Peut-être qu'on aurait pu faire des sondages avant, quelque chose comme ça. Un bon sondage, c'est pas si cher que ça. Puis tu essaies de joindre le plus de monde possible parce que, non, c est, c est, ça évite des discriminations, des choses comme ça, c'est les injustices, whatever, tu sais. Je pense qu'une église, c'est collectif. Ça. Il y en a qui achètent ça pour des condos. Mais franchement, là, à mon avis, c'est collectif. Ouais, ouais, ouais. Que tu sois religieux ou athée, c'est pour la population, c'est ouais, pour ouais. la communauté. Ouais. Ouais, ouais. Toute, toute religion confondue, c'est le faux. Hein? Voilà, point final. <rire> The stories of Pont Saint Charles and in this city that allows for this one-sided approach that that completely ignores the complete community. Like, is is there a is there a solution? Like, is it? I know it's difficult, but but there seems to be a complete breakdown of planning that you have to fight by block, by street, by neighborhood, mm -hmm. in this way. Mm -hmm. This is uh, remarkable. And, and so I think about planning. Is, is, there a, is there a playbook to be able to correct these terrible problems? There's no one playbook for every city, I mean, uh, I think. But one of the very important defining features of many cities um, in Canada is that they remain, quote unquote, creatures of the province. And because of this, a lot of cities are lacking means for which, by which they can make their own revenue. So property taxes are one of the few areas where the, Quebec, uh, where the provincial kind of legislation, they're permitted to raise their own revenue through property taxes. There are many other taxes or other means of generating revenue that are not actually permitted or uh, you know, they're given a license to for. And so because of this kind of restrictive public finance issue in some ways, uh, this then prioritizes certain paths to development uh, over others and forecloses others in that way. So one of the things, is, the, ch the ongoing challenges, is for cities to have more power. Because in the context of what we've called in the chapter neoliberal globalization, one of the things that's happened since the 70s and the 80s is that cities become more responsible for the provision of local services more and more responsibility is placed on cities. At the same time that they, we have some fiscal crises happening because of the loss of industry, because of restructuring. So we do have a kind of federation of Canadian municipalities, right? But one of the, the big questions I think is how can cities in two ways leverage power to push back as well. Um, first, to push back against higher levels of government that do not offer you know, other ways of re raising revenue, but also to push back against market pressures, against capital, capitalist market pressures that are increasingly shaping our cities without allowing for much voice. And so there's really multiple things here going on simultaneously. On the one hand, cities need to coordinate with one another 
to push back against the power of the province relative to cities and to try to acquire more resources. But that's not enough. The other thing, and it's an issue that's raised in the book, I think, quite well, is that there are, and it has been in Montreal, a long legacy of social movements. Um, and the city needs to be more aligned with those social movements in defining city agendas and using the power of movements that have already mobilized uh, for that purpose, right? For re rethinking. So there's both kind of looking inwards and, and looking at local needs, but also there's a pressure coming from, out, from upper levels that uh, also simultaneously needs to be addressed. And um, I think one of the inspirations for this book that I highly recommend is a book called Capital City, The Rise of the Real Estate State by Samuel Stein. Uh, which looks at the case of New York, but there are some parallels that are affecting a lot of cities, even though cities themselves have different govern, you know, they're situated in different governance structures. And I think that's also a fabulous book that looks specifically at the constraints planners face in this present moment, actually, and thinking through that. And, and it lays it out very beautifully. So I highly recommend the book. It's uh, my Verso books. Uh, it's Capital City. Si je peux rajouter, je suis d'accord avec Norma, le statut des villes est vraiment, le statut des villes est vraiment problématique. Je pense que j'ajoute pas, je l'ai bien expliqué. Mais dans l'expérience qu'on a actuellement, des fois la ville de Montréal est à la remorque des promoteurs immobiliers. Je prends le, le Molson, hein, le brasserie Molson. Il a fallu comme trop pédaler pour euh, enlever certains aspects négatifs. Mais la ville devrait, à mon avis, utiliser plus ses pouvoirs réglementaires pour encadrer le développement. Euh, c'est vrai, les mouvements sociaux sont importants, c'est comme ça qu'on fait pression sur la ville pour qu'elle affirme ses pouvoirs réglementaires et qu'elle encadre vraiment le développement. Mais actuellement, la ville, bon, je pense avec tout le rapport de force qui existe, euh, elle ne l'affirme pas assez. Les plans d'urbanisme, le règlement, il y a des, des moyens de contraindre davantage que la ville devrait utiliser, à mon avis. Je pense que c'est les mouvements citoyens, comme tu le dis, qui doivent pousser à sens Je veux juste dire une phrase, c'est que la commission Charbonneau n'a rien réglé, définitivement. Et puis, d'après moi, ils n'ont pas eu des pénalités, ça n'a pas été appliqué. Ils ont gueulé en cours, si vous voulez, j'aurais dû assister, mais en tout cas, la population avait le droit, mais ça n'a rien réglé. Le, 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 le « greeting », ça va toujours exister. Les mouvements de la mafia, c'est très oui, insidieux. Oui. « It's under the carpet oui, », you know. Oui. I'm sorry to say that. Oui, oui. You know. oui, oui. C'est un fait. C'est pas juste dans les films, ça. C'est pas juste dans les « Godfather ». Ça existe. It's a fact. Oui, oui. Mais, and, uh, just to add, and, and, I mean, the... The thing about, uh, I mean, in, in, in going to what Justin was saying, there, there are regulatory, you know, when, when, I mean, the issue of planning is a big one, right? So you have the, the PMAD, right? The master plan for Montreal, right? And sort of its development. Then you had the implementation of what was called transport-oriented development, which sounded really nice, and it is nice, right? The idea that if we redensify our neighborhoods around public transit nodes, uh, rely less on cars, we'll, but these got all scooped up by the big developers. Yeah. And that's what happened, right? And then, and in some places, the unfortunate reality is, is that uh, the city you know, will react after the fact, right? And the developers are using a strategy of, of essentially, you know, what was that famous movie? If you build it, they will come, you know, mm -hmm. the baseball diamond. Field of dreams. Field of dreams. Yeah. They're using that strategy. And the biggest example is uh, what's called the triangle, right? It's mm -hmm. this, uh, it didn't exist, the word didn't even exist until two years ago, right? The, the triangle, right? Which was essentially uh, 
from mountain sites mm -hmm. all the way to Kupfer 2, mm -hmm. uh, all the way to Blue Bonnets, all the way to uh, Victoria Coconage, and even a bit. And all of a sudden, they created a new area of the city. And you watch, uh, and the and it's one or two. It's not. It's not a flurry of competition when you look into these developers, right? It's, there's usually it's it's a pie that's kind of cut the city, right? And and mm -hmm. Davinco gets this. Uh, you know, Dev Miguel gets this. Group Mark gets points in Charles. Everybody gets a little piece of the pie, but it's fair, right? And that's what happens between the developers, right? And but with and and in the triangle, all of a sudden, you know, with Raymond and these other projects, is that all of a sudden the city is waking up and realizing all the cities, right? So you have uh, Sue Montgomery uh, having to negotiate with Cote Saint Luke, having to negotiate with Ville Saint Laurent because there's no public transit that goes in between any of these new developments. Mm -hmm. The facilities aren't functional. It crosses the decay. It's a complete mess. And it's a regulatory mess now. And the developers never considered it or cared for it. The idea is you put your feet on the ground, you start building. Maestro is the other big example, right? Mm -hmm. A little permit for the city for a, a, a close to a 100-story building. And even when the city said, we didn't give you the permit yet, they didn't stop building. They're, they're, they, they've kept building, and they still don't have the permit for the height that they're requiring, right? So really? they're bluffing. A lot of these developers now are willing to bluff the city uh, and, you know, finally plant, put her foot down once at the children's hospital, you know, when they refused the permit for the fourth tower because there was no school. They lied, right? They said they would put a school, no school, but the children's hospital uh, development, right? So there, there, there is this strategy on their part too, is that they're, they build it first and then, and then see what the city will do after, right? This is the, you know, J'ajouterais par exemple le règlement 2020 qui est un pas en avant, hein, 20 de logements sociaux, 20 de logements familiaux, 20 de logements abordables. Mais les promoteurs préfèrent payer la pénalité, c'est plus payant pour eux, puis construire comme ils veulent des condos de luxe. I just want to add that I think it really boils down to the question that many people named in the chapters in the book, which is really who is development for? What is the goal of the development? And it's really tied to what Norma says, you know, the whole funding structure of the city and the money that will come to the city through property taxes and things like that. I mean, the issue is the starting point is not let's develop to respond to the needs of the residents of our city. It's this structure that's already in place. And the triangle development is, is an excellent example, I think. I worked in Cote at that time. There was a great report from the Public Consultation Office with some excellent recommendations, including and the word socialization, I think, was actually in the report that all of the buildings on Mountain Sites Avenue, it's not a word you see all that often, you know, in, in consultation reports, but the idea really was the recognition that these all of these buildings and all of these tenants and families need to be protected from the speculation that's going to come. So there were some great recommendations in that report, but many of them were not implemented. And so I think it really does come back to that question of what is our vision for development? Whose vision are we talking about? The examples from Point St. Charles and from here also are so inspiring for that reason because it's the vision of the community that's put forward and that's the basis on which we're trying to develop. So anyway, I just want to say also thank you so much for your book. I found it to be an inspiring book and just a great reminder of the power of community organizing and mobilization. And I, I, we all know that there are huge challenges, but they're, they're just very thought-provoking and great examples. And I just thought it was a great book. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much, Jen. And maybe on that note, uh, so thank you again, everybody, for coming. In. Uh, just before we close up, just some uh, um, announcements. If you want to buy the book, it's back there at a special price of twenty dollars in English and French. The, the English version. We just got the French version yesterday. So. Oh, no, the French.